Hi, my name is Kevin and I collect old irons. When I was an undergraduate student at Virginia Tech many years ago, my favorite professor was Richard Schallenberg who taught a variety of courses in the history of science and technology. I took all the five classes he had at the undergraduate level and if I'd taken a few history core courses I probably would have had a history degree to add to the geology degree that I ultimately got. In Schallenberg's classes, we talked a lot about Roman history. The Romans were consummate engineers. And I remember Schallenberg once saying that if it were not for one thing, the Romans might actually have invented planes, trains, and automobiles. That one thing that the Romans did not have was a patent law. The United States, very early in its history, building on British traditions, established a patent law. And that is responsible for many of the innovations, I think, that our country has been largely responsible for in planes, trains, and irons. Patents are a significant way to track the history of old irons and other subjects as well. The topic of patents is quite arcane. Over the past month or so, I have been tutored and had numerous conversations with Dennis McDonald, who is something of the patent guru in our iron collecting community. And I've learned a fair amount of the basics that I'd like to share with you, and I, and I hope that as I learn more, we can get a little deeper into this subject. The American Patent Office was established in 1790. Our country was issuing patents before it was minting coins. No patent was numbered until 1838, and much of that early history and the patent models associated with that were lost through fire. Over the period that most of these irons come from, 1860 to the 20th century, patents were valid for 17 years. Until 1880, Patent models were generally required, and many of the old patent models still exist and are currently dispersed in public hands. There are some significant collections of these. The inventor or inventors would patent a device. That inventor might license the patent to any of a variety of manufacturers under various terms. The inventor might work for a company and would do the patent and then assign that patent to his employer. The inventor might sell the patent to somebody else, in which case the patent would be reissued. And finally, the most important part of the patent application is the claim, which is usually at the end of the patent, where the patentee specifies exactly what is novel about the invention. And what Dennis particularly wanted to impress upon me, and me onto you, is that in order to understand the patent, you have got to read the claim. The drawing can be quite different from the ultimate iron that might result from the patent. It is all about the claim. In American patent law, there are two basic kinds of patents that apply to our subject. These are the utility patent, and the design patent. Utility patents are granted to anyone who invents or discovers a process, machine, manufacture, composition, or other new and useful improvement. The classic example of a utility patent was by the Wright brothers who patented the airplane. Not a particular design of airplane, but the airplane in general. You cannot even now fly an airplane without incorporation of their general design and control. So let me here talk about several noteworthy utility patents that have significance in iron history, and then we'll talk about an interesting design patent. A good example of a utility patent applied to irons would be the John Kosler 1901 patent of a recessed slot in the base of the iron in order to press the fabric around a button. The design itself is remarkably simple. An iron includes a slot that can iron past both sides of a button and the drawing merely expresses the idea. There was never an iron that looked like this. 
There were a number of companies that licensed this patent, each in their own way. I do not actually own an example to show you here, but Dennis McDonald has written a paper about these impressing news, which includes a couple of photographs from Iron Talks, which I use here. Here, for example, is a picture of a Mrs. Potts style iron with one end opened up to include a slot. Nelson Streeter adapted this idea for a sensible sleeve iron. Both of these irons are fairly unusual, but not particularly expensive. There are, however, Potts and sensible collectors who are willing to pay more for these than I am at the auctions. Here are two more unusual and rare irons that use this patent. One of these is a detachable handle iron from the Howell Company with a slot offset from the point of the iron. And here is a flat iron with a slot in a similar location. These are four very different irons from different companies that each paid Costler for the use of his patent. It turns out that very few people really wanted to go to the trouble of ironing around the buttons. I think they just ironed over the buttons by and large. And so consequently, these irons are quite unusual. The latter two that I've showed uh, would I don't know what the values would be, but probably in the several hundred dollars. A very interesting flat iron, actually a group of flat irons, is the star. The star irons come in a variety of sizes. These are relatively small ones that can get to quite large sizes, oftentimes polishing irons as well. The iron takes the general appearance of a Mrs. Potts iron, and these were manufactured by the same company, Enterprise, but there is no detachable handle. It does have holes in the handle, and if you look at these, you will very frequently see two patents given. October 1st, 1867, and January 16th, 1877. The October 1, 1867 patent is from Arthur Hubble, who had a patent for, and this is from the claim, employment of a non-conducting material within the iron. This patent was used on the Hubble flat iron, and we saw one of these in our second video a long time ago, made in Elmira, New York. Now, what Hubble did, his iron has a bottom part and a top part to the base, and in between is an insulating material, and I've never heard it precisely stated what that specific insulator might be. And then that patent was picked up and used by Enterprise for the Mrs. Potts handles. This is a Mrs. Potts polishing iron. And right here is the patent for October 1, 1867. The second patent on the star iron is January 16, 1877. And that is a patent by John Baker and Henry Asbury. These two inventors were likely employed by Enterprise and then assigned the patent to the company. That patent combines the insulator with a perforated hollow handle. I think this might have been a bit of a salesman's gimmick, for there were a lot of people that still liked using sat irons but wanted to use the latest Mrs. Potts style. And then that patent was carried on to the star irons. One thing you might notice in a study of the wide variety of different irons is that shields are very common uh, among American coal irons such as the Bless and Drake for example and among the slug irons such as this iron here but you very very seldom see them on flat irons or detachable handled irons and I think the reason for that is that Joel Gleason patented the shield in combination with flat and polishing irons in 1870 and in 1873. These resulted in the Gleason flat irons, and I include here a picture from a recent Hartzell auction. This iron sold for $100, and was more commonly produced in the Gleason polisher, of which I have a specimen here. Gleason may well have been willing to defend his patent, thus the other manufacturers stayed away from this innovation, and consequently there are few other flat or detachable handle irons that have shields. And we should do a fluter patent, of course. This we saw earlier in the video on the hand fluters. This is the Elgin fluter, which has a brass plate here with a corrugated 
slug that pulls out onto a shelf. And that comes from a patent by Francis Perkins from Elgin, Illinois, hence the Elgin Fluter. And Perkins also licensed that patent to the Dottie Company, which made a very similar kind of device, though more massively built, I think, and was less susceptible to the breakage that the more flimsy constructed Elgin Fluter had. And for the last of our examples of a utility patent, we'll look at the new leader gasoline iron, something we've seen before. And for the example of a patent, we'll look at the 1897 Coates and Corbett patent. The new leader had a novel idea of the top being something that you could take off, and then you could light this and get the get the fires burning and then put this back on. The iron here has an 1894 patent mentioned on the top and then we have an 1897 patent that you're looking at and there are some other patents as well. Actually quite a variety of patents as um, they were doing modifications to the insides. What the patents show is that this iron had a, a long history of six or more years perhaps and was a very important iron in the history of the liquid fuel irons in that it established the uh, methods of heating the inside but then was rapidly replaced circa 1901 and 1902 by new designs that allowed you to heat the insides without taking the iron apart to do so. We are now going to talk about a couple of examples of design patents. Uh, design patent being for a original new ornamental design. And our examples are going to come from the Ober Manufacturing Company. Ober was a company that had a lot of very stylish products. Oftentimes in the iron ballywick centered around this nicely shaped stylized curved top to the handle. And that was first established in a July 31, 1894 patent. And then there were many subsequent patents with different latch mechanisms. This particular one is a salesman sample we saw in our premiere video. This is a sleeve iron. Again, these had a long history, but as with the Mrs. Potts style handles put out by Enterprise, there still were a variety of people still using flat irons, but interested in using at least the, the new designs. And so, in March 19, 1912, Ober patented this flat iron design, again with a nice stylized handle in the context of a flat iron. Ober continued doing patents and doing irons for quite some time thereafter, and I have here a picture of an Ober electric iron, this picture provided by Jay Raymond and coming out of his Streamline Irons book. And so there we have a patent, uh, not exactly used as a trademark, but certainly to establish uh, a record of using irons and iron handles of this particular shape. And with that, we are done with this preliminary piece about patents. Uh, this is still a, a work in progress in terms of my own education. And as I learn some more, and I know again from Dennis McDonald that I've got a lot more to learn, I hope I have an opportunity to tell you about that.